Hey everyone, welcome back to the shop. So we're taking a brief break from diamond turning today and looking at something a little different. A quick little project I whipped up earlier this week. Everyone's seen, uh, or I feel like most people who are watching this at least have seen the famous Kingsbury uh, aerodynamic tilting pad bearing uh, on YouTube. Of course, of course, uh, Steve Mould featured the one that Tom Lipton made. Uh, Dave Arneson has shown one on his channel. Uh, they're pretty, they're sort of the introduction that people get to aerodynamic bearings. I thought, you know, I'd have a go at one of these myself, but minus the tilting pads. So I've made a little bit of a different one here today. This is a spiral groove aerodynamic bearing. So similar to the tilting pad ones you've seen before, I can give this a little spin here. And just like that, completely frictionlessly spins around for quite a while. Here's the difference here though. Let's try it in the other direction. Nothing, not at all. Only works in the counterclockwise direction. Let's crack it open, take a look at why. So here's the inside of that bearing. And immediately you can see this is not the traditional tilting pad type uh, you've seen before. Basically the general idea is still the same. We have two lapped, lapped flat plates. So the shaft here, there's this separate shaft and this, just this little plate around the outside I've lapped uh, to be flat to under a micron. We'll talk about the lapping in just a moment here. But the secret is in the base. So the base here is also lapped to be extremely flat, but you can see these spiral grooves in the part. So these were actually machined with our fiber laser uh, we've got, and they're machined to a depth of about four and a half tenths, or just under half a thou. So they're extremely shallow. You can feel them, uh, but they're nice and smooth and consistent and of this very shallow depth. So basically the mechanism, it's a bit different from the tilting pad, is as this rotating plate spins, you have a boundary layer of air on it, and because air has viscosity, you have a no-slip condition on the plate, and so it drags air through these grooves as it spins. The air is moving through, getting dragged by the plate. It reaches the end, it has nowhere to go. It piles up, if you will, builds pressure, and that pressure pushes up and leaks leaks onto the rest of the land here, the bearing land, and that pressure uh, supports the bearing and lifts the, lifts the thrust plate up. So it, complete, it floats completely frictionlessly on this plate, uh, frictionlessly apart from the, the shear drag from the air. Uh, the center here, of course, it's, it's not truly frictionlessly, frictionless either because we do need some sort of radial constraint to keep this in the center, otherwise it would just you know, slide off the side and go everywhere. But we want that to be very low friction as well to not uh, not take away from the the uh, incredible effect of the, air, the aerodynamic bearing going on. So what I've got there, this is a very thin shaft in the center of, of this here. This is a 50 thou diameter uh, shaft. And in the center of the base, we have a small polymer bushing of the same size. So we want, this is a, this is a actually Diamant DWH. So not technically a bearing material, but it's a nice rigid wear resistant uh, polymer. That is just a piece of stock we had lying around uh, that worked well for this. We want this to be nice and uh, not, not a loose slip fit, but not a snug fit. So it doesn't interfere too much. Just something to constrain it radially but not have too much friction. The other criteria and why it's a polymer is we want it to have uh, uh, insulating properties electrically, because that's one of the ways we can validate this bearing's performance is if we have a uh, continuity check across the whole thing. Uh, many people have probably seen this in Steve Mould's video. You can check to see that the bearing is in fact floating and not touching the uh, main base here. So that's a that's a really neat way of, of making sure that it's working. But I just thought I'd try this out and 
surprisingly it worked on the first try what this is this is just 4140 here in soft condition uh super non-ideal but i mean this was this was a good a good first shot uh and i, th I think it's i think it proves the concept nicely uh, i'll mention briefly the lapping procedure that we used for this uh, you'll notice these aren't super shiny uh, i promise the geometry is at least decent. I can put a little inset uh, for that right here. Here's the ghetto fizzo image. Me sliding it around on here. Kind of tricky to see here. Not perfect, but the bands, at least over the area that they're active, are decently consistent. Not ideal, but workable for this. But the thing to note is, of course, the, the finish isn't particularly shiny. That's because <clears throat> the lapping procedure for this uh, involved two steps. So I've highlighted my lapping plates before. I've used them in another video. For the roughing to get these generally flat, because these weren't these were not ground. Uh, these I just lapped straight off the lathe. Uh, it took a little while, but just thought it would be a fun little exercise. Uh, but I was noticing it was having a hard time getting a good of a material removal uh, at first because these are cast iron plates, soft 4140 uh, parts. The difference in hardness between these isn't really that great. So I was having, a, having trouble getting the diamond to charge really well. Uh, and so what I did is I stuck some good old aluminum tape on there, just the, for the stuff for uh, air ducts and whatnot. And what you can do is, you know, imagine you've put this all over the whole plate, but if you stick it on there in a patch and give it, you know, a good rub and get it to, to bond nicely, you really still can realize the advantage of the grooves there. So the grooves, you know, they've, the aluminum tape sort of sinks into the grooves. It's super, it's dead soft, so the diamond charges in it really well. And I was able to get a really nice material removal rate charging this up with seven micron diamond and just blasting some material off there. And because it was charged uh, and actually cutting in a nice classical lapping action, uh, the finish was, was superb. Uh, actually really mirror-like on these parts. But there was, there was a little bit of rounding just because of the aluminum squishiness and it not being perfectly flat. So for final, final geometry, I transferred, I took the tape off and just went direct on cast iron. Uh, and that worked really well. The thing is, because of that uh, sort of relative hardness difference that wasn't very large, uh, I was not able to get a charged cutting action, and it was really just tumbling, tumbling abrasion uh, the whole time, which is why we have sort of this more matte finish, is because the particles weren't, weren't charged and cutting nicely. They were just sort of rolling, rolling between the two plates, like as they moved against each other, which really isn't ideal, uh, but in the end it got me a little bit better geometry at the sacrifice of finish, and finish isn't really what we're all about here. Uh, anyway, those were the lessons learned there. I want to make some hardened ones of these in the future, so we'll definitely uh, be able to get a good charge on these then, and hopefully get a better finish as well. But just thought I'd share a couple insights on the lapping procedure for these. Uh, anyway, that's about it. Uh, hope that was interesting, and I'll uh, see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.